Good afternoon. I'm Kirk Harmon with the Harmon Group, a structural engineering firm headquartered in Philadelphia. I'm also president of the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat Philadelphia chapter. I'd like to welcome all of you to our first virtual program, Urban Habitat, the Future of Public Space. Thank you to our sponsors for this program, Brandywine Realty Trust, Ballack Consulting Engineers, Ernie McHenry Architecture, and the Harmon Group Structural Engineers. We have some upcoming programs in the works uh, when we're able to start in-person meetings again. These include Brandywine's Drexel Square, a new public space in the heart of University City 30th Street Station construction boom. Dranoff's Art House, a new high-end residential tower now under construction in the middle of the Avenue of the Arts. Aramark's headquarters at 2400 Market Street, a creative reuse and vertical expansion of a former industrial building for a new corporate headquarters on the Schuylkill River waterfront. The Gallery, Philadelphia Fashion District, the repositioning of the gallery into the new Philadelphia Fashion District. And Riverwalk, a new mixed use development project along the Schuylkill River waterfront connecting to the Schuylkill River Walk. Just a quick reminder that um, this is the last day to donate to the COVID related organizations through the registration link. Please support the cause. The Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat is the world's leading resource for professionals focused on the inception, design, construction, and operation of tall buildings and future cities. Please visit ctbuh.org for more information on the valuable resources available from this international organization. You can become a member at ctbuh.org slash get dash involved, or you can go to the main website. Uh, now I would like to introduce Scott Erty, principal at Erty McHenry Architecture, who will serve as our moderator today and introduce the panel. Scott's work pursues a methodology where form embodies purpose and sense of place is revealed through the careful intersection of program, site, and culture. Since establishing Ernie McHenry Architecture with David McHenry, Scott's design work has received many accolades from the local and national press, as well as his peers, and his, has received more than 30 state, local, and national awards. Scott received his undergraduate degree from Ohio State University and his master's degree from Syracuse, where he studied under the stalwart modernist Werner Seligman. He currently teaches a graduate housing studio at the University of Pennsylvania and lectures widely on his work. Scott? Thank you, Kirk. It's uh, great to be here. Um, it's an exciting topic uh, to discuss. And uh, when we thought about this, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more hopeful. I think there's a million webinars going on right now about all the bad things about COVID, all the things that are sort of about how to wash your hands, uh, stay out of your office space, wear a mask, those things. But we thought it would be great to do something that's a bit more optimistic that talks about our urban environment. And as we started discussing this, it's really about the fact that cities have always dealt with problems and hardships and varying conditions. So in this case, <clears throat> this is not unlike uh, things that have happened in the past. So we're gonna discuss that uh, uh, today. So we've got a great group of panelists. I do encourage you to become a member. It's a very exciting organization. Um, I know that um, a number of my students are on the, on the screen right now watching. So um, please join, because I will tell this to all the young professionals, whenever we get a resume and it says that you're a member of uh, CTBUH, you definitely get an interview. So uh, keep that in mind. So our panelists today are, are, are friends of ours. Thank you, Kirk, for the introduction. Um, all folks that have a very interesting and unique perspective on this topic. So uh, first, David Brownlee, um, historian, University of Pennsylvania. If you have heard him speak, he's very engaging. Love to listen to him. Gary Hack, who was my first boss at an Ivy League institution and uh, still a friend. Uh, Devin Liddell, who's a principal futurist at uh, Teague and also a writer for Fast Company. Jerry Sweeney. Um, who is a, uh, a president and CEO of Brandywine Liberty Trust, um, Brandywine Realty Trust, and uh, Barbara Jones is an epidemiologist. I think I got everybody there. 
So um, with that, this is an AIA event sponsor, so you will get one hour of HSW credit. We're gonna learn a little bit about the historical perspective of pandemics uh, and, and urban habitat under crisis. You'll be able to uh, theorize on how future spaces might be configured to varying degrees of risk. Uh, we're gonna look at a multitude of ad hoc responses to, responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're gonna look at strategies for mixed use habitations and you're gonna gain a better understanding of urban form and how to use alternative models uh, that make the city more resilient to the future. So with that, we're gonna get started. First, we have David Brownlee. He's a historian at the University of Pennsylvania, a uh, wonderful speaker and uh, somebody who you could just talk to for hours because he seems to know everything about everything. And he's been a, a, a great mentor of mine over the years and a friend. Um, he, he's a, re he's a uh, expert on uh, historian of modern architecture and urbanism in Europe. Uh, and he's, uh, his views are widely sought after, uh, does a lot of writing, a lot of teaching, a lot of lecturing. So, uh, David, I'm going to make you, give you control and let you take it away. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, it's lovely to be with, with you this afternoon and to bring you some good news from the past. Uh, good news about the versatility uh, of those great urban public spaces like these in Philadelphia, um, that the coronavirus epidemic has made us look at afresh. I believe that these spaces are durable, versatile resources, and that we don't need to think that the memorable distinctiveness of their features is connected in any singular way to an unchanging function. Um, they are, in short, uh, what Aldo Rossi called in 1966, Fati Urbani, urban artifacts. Um, and I, in the present situation and in the future, I believe that we can use them in new ways to meet our new needs without putting their cultural value at risk. Um, there, there are all kinds of urban artifacts. And today I'll say just a few words about the versatility of two, parks and streets, uh, starting with streets and quintessentially the boulevard. The etymology of the word boulevard Hmm. The etymology of the word boulevard signals the versatility of the form. <laughs> Sorry, a little getting ahead of myself there. The etymology, uh, uh, the, the word comes from the same root as bulwark, and boulevard was originally the name applied to fortifications, like these in Paris. By the 17th century, artillery had made that kind of boulevard obsolete. Um, but when Louis XIV began to demolish the walls of Paris in, eight, in 1670, the circumferential roadway that replaced the walls preserved the name Boulevard. That name stuck, and even when, as the growing city absorbed the 17th century exurban ring road and changed its function, um, the roads that, uh, with, that we think of as the, uh, the familiar circuit of inner boulevards in Paris retained the name, they retained the name Boulevard. There was, of course, a second generation of boulevards created in the 1850s and 1860s by Napoleon III and Baron Haussmann, and these were also functional chameleons. Their creation was originally conceived as a way to provide employment through public works, uh, to speed transport, and to enable the police and army to prevent re recurrences of the street fighting of 1830 and 1848. Of course, these Second Empire boulevards were almost immediately transformed from those objectives into a stage set for the enactment of modern life. This change was signaled by the literal theatricality of the ceremonies with which the streets were inaugurated. This is the Boulevard Sebastopol in 1858, complete with admission tickets and, and, a, and a curtain. And also by their ensemble performance, together with the actual theaters like the new opera, and the other sites of public gathering and entertainment, museums and department stores among them. This theatrical city, this was this theatrical city, this phantasmagoric Paris was what Walter Benjamin called the capital of the 19th century. The Parisian stage was a remarkable durable urban artifact, um, uh, even when the drama that played out on it was violent. The boulevards were the decor for the defeat of France in the, in the Franco-Prussian War. And they were the setting 
for the bloody street fighting of the commune that followed. But then, no sooner had, that, had the curtain fallen on that tragedy than it rose again on the operetta that was the Paris of the Belle Epoque. Paris demonstrated and exported this versatile urbanism in a series of world's fairs, uh, model cities really, which were emulated in America nowhere more influentially than in Chicago in 1893, where the city beautiful movement and city planning had its birth. And the ideals of that movement were fulfilled nowhere more completely than in Philadelphia, which in 1907 began the demolition for the, dem for the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. That unforgettably simple urban artifact connecting the huge metropolis, the huge industrial city with its giant urban, with its giant park. That boulevard's simple physical form proved to be remarkable, remarkably versatile in function. It was originally conceived as an avenue lined by public buildings leading to the park. But when many of the invited institutions failed to make the move, it was reconceived and realized as a parkway, bringing the park into the city. And when the automobile demonstrated that it was not a passing fad, the parkway proved that it could be a highway too. Lately, of course, the parkway has shown that it can accommodate, in a way, gigantic outdoor performances. The problems with this should warn us that even the most potent urban artifacts cannot do literally everything. Let me give just a third example of a memorable street system that changed function while keeping its form. This is the so-called Ringstrasse of Vienna, which was laid out as a belt around the city when the emperor ordered the demolition of the city's walls in 1857. There was a competition, and in 1859, this plan, which joined together ideas from several of the entries, was adopted. Like Paris's 19th century boulevards, the Ringstrasse was also designed to help police and troops maintain civil order. Gigantic fortified barracks were positioned around it, putting, uh, putting almost all of the city within the range of rifle fire. And a huge parcel of land was reserved as a parade ground uh, for the military. But that big dusty expanse was seen as a wasted opportunity by the increasingly powerful bourgeois and democratic forces of Austria-Hungary. And in 1870, they convinced the emperor to cede the parade ground to them, to make it available as a public park and as a site for public buildings. Here arose the town hall, the national parliament, and the university. Bourgeois interests also seized another nearby site, the site that was slated in the original plan for a pair of barracks. This strong visual artifact was repurposed for another pairing, for the natural history and the art history museums in which the imperial collect collections were open to the public. Our memorable urban parks have also proved to be immensely versatile. Returning to Paris, the, we find that the Bois de Boulogne began as a royal hunting retreat, conveniently located between Paris and Versailles, which I point out were about the same size in the 18th century. It was laid out with formal Baroque walkways, and in 1777, Louis XVI allowed his brother to build this little entertainment pavilion in the precincts. But early 19th century Paris had almost no public parkland, and in 1852, Napoleon III remedied this situation by giving the forest to the city. Development of the park followed, the development of it as a public park followed in sync with the making of the boulevards. And for this, the engineer Adolphe Affand provided a design in the English style with carefully manicured artificially, uh, with a carefully manicured artificial naturalism and facilities for all classes, horse racing for the aristocrats, avenues for carriages for the upper middle class and a lake for boating and in winter skating for the others. Philadelphia's Fairmount Park has a similar, has a similarly, uh, has served a similar variety of functions since land acquisition began in 1855. It had first been conceived for a practical purpose, to stop the industrialization of the Schuylkill River Valley, which threatened the quality of the water pumped to the city from the Fairmount Waterworks. But the waterworks itself had begun right at the start to have more than a utilitarian function. It, it and its gardens were a venue for public amusement. 
and the new much larger Fairmount Park was almost immediately put to work as the site of the greatest mass entertainment yet staged in America, the 1876 Centennial Exhibition. The park was then rapidly transformed by the greatest social innovation of the later 19th century, the invention of recreation. As in Paris, some of this was relatively for the relatively elite, like rowing. But new sports broadened the base. These included baseball and cricket and tennis, and here cycling, and here swimming. Uh, that's a floating swimming pool moored at the waterworks with a boat hire dock to the right of it. The versatility of the modern urban park is perhaps nowhere better illustrated than in the League Island, now FDR Park, at the south end of Broad Street. It was planned in 1912 by the Olmsted brothers um, in what was then a rather old-fashioned picturesque style, but it was equipped for modern recreation. This included baseball diamonds and the paving of the bottom of one of the substantial lakes to make it suitable for swimming. The functions changed rapidly and steadily. The eastern, eastern part of the park was ceded to the sesquicentennial exhibition in, eight, in 1926 for the construction of a stadium. And in 1940, the vacant land to the west of the park was annexed as a golf course to serve the changing tastes of the citizens of our row house city. In this 1954 photograph, it still looks more like a work of imagination than of landscape architecture. But by that time, the leaking swimming pool lake had already been, had, had already been replaced by an in-ground in swimming pool, and, uh, uh, which was in turn abandoned in 1996 because, like the lake, um, it, uh, it was hard to maintain in the marshy ground uh, there in South Philadelphia. Which brings us to the decision in 2019 uh, to give up fighting the rising water level to abandon the golf course, which is closed um, and will be replaced according to the new master plan by a wetlands habitat, by a wetland habitat. Um, this bows not just to the forces of nature, but to the changing desires of the public, who now list hiking, biking, and observing nature as their favorite activities. Fortunately, our visually characterful urban landscapes are also functionally versatile. Thanks. That's fascinating. Thank you, David. That's, uh, like I said, always interesting topics. I think that, you know, a lot of those cases were uh, cases where something happened, like this, the idea of Fairmont Park really cleaning up the, uh, the watershed for the city of Philadelphia. But in a case where you have uh, sort of the need to stay at home, how does that shape urban space? Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I think one of the things that defines the, our conception of modernism um, and has for two centuries is that the modern, modern life is defined by motion. People are in motion and cities are designed um, to, uh, to accommodate uh, and facilitate movement uh, from home to job, from, uh, from job to recreation, um, and, to, uh, and to allow uh, and to celebrate that, that, acti that motion. I think um, coronavirus maybe has forced us to think about some of the infrastructure that we've created like roadways as, con as conceivably useful for something else. Maybe not for long distance transit, but maybe for a, a short hop on a bicycle. And mm -hmm. certainly the importance and significance of nearby parkland uh, that can be reached easily um, within, uh, within a few minutes of one's home, uh, the importance of that kind of parkland is enormously increased at this time. Mm -hmm. You know, fortunately, we have parkland close at hand and we have streets. Um, you know, it is a question of reconsidering what, you know, what purposes we put to them. Yeah, fantastic. That was great. Um, I will point out to the audience that um, there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to submit questions and we're going to get, um, we'll answer them either during the event here or towards the end of it. We'll have a little bit more of a Q&A time. And I would welcome, like we have people from across the globe, uh, India, Australia, um, uh, a number of places. It's, it's a, a fascinating uh, world event today, although it's a uh, it's a world problem we're dealing with. So our next uh, panelist is Barbara Jones. She's an epidemiologist. Um, she uh, <clears throat> has a, an amazing uh, resume here for this topic. Uh, she serves as a public health, health officer in the Air National Guard uh, branch of the Air Force. She ho holds the rank of major, so it's Major Barbara. Um, and she's uh, formerly a member of the Chemical, <laughs> Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear and High Yield Explosive Enhanced Response Force Package 
uh, which is used during disaster, natural, terroristic, or accidental. So she's a great asset. Um, she's helped me on several projects. She's a fascinating person and, again, interesting. And uh, I welcome you, Barbara, for your comments. Thank you so much, Scott, for being here. So I promise I'm not going to bore everyone with the epidemiology. I'm sure we're all getting enough of that on the news every evening. So. Um, I promise I won't mention any r nots or anything fun like that. So um, I wanted to start in a little bit of the history. So pandemics have occurred throughout written history and probably obviously before written history. And they have had significant consequences on urban spaces. So the Great Plague is one that I'm sure everyone is familiar with, um, all more commonly known as the Black Death. Um, and this occurred between 1346 and about 1353. And its impact on urban design is so what happened during the Black Death is the city itself became um, kind of this view of it, it became that it was the cause, right? It became dirty. And so there was this mass exodus from London um, into the countryside where the countryside was actually viewed as healthier um, and that green space and things like that. And so there is actually a significant change in how urban space was used um, because of the Black Death and, and what was occurring. The Black Death is also actually credited with playing a role in the end of the feudal system, um, that serfdom system, and so that completely changed as well how people moved and used and worked in an urban space. Um, and so the next one that I wanted to bring up is the cholera pandemic. Um, so the cholera pandemic of 1852 is really fascinating. So um, the cholera pandemic is a bacteria is more waterborne. Um, it was a worldwide pandemic, um, which means it affected multiple countries across the world. Um, and this uh, pandemic um, actually killed 23,000 in the UK alone. Um, John Snow, the father of modern epidemiology, um, was actually in the UK and he actually identified a public well as a source of an outbreak in a town and he actually stopped all the local cases by removing that handle and preventing use of that well. Um, and so it just goes to show again how people use urban space and what's available can really um, interact with infectious disease. Um, and I also wanted to point out, so the cholera pandemic was really fascinating because there was still a significant amount of movement across the globe, but it was a lot, obviously was done by ship at that time. And so ships would actually come into port and there would be a flag um, raised. And depending on the color of the flag would determine whether or not you were allowed to disembark. Um, and so if a certain color flag was waving, the ship would actually be turned around and sent away. Um, which makes getting back on an airplane seem like not a problem. You know, if you're talking about a month long ship ride, getting into port and being told, nope, there's an outbreak of cholera here, you can't come on. Um, but even if you were allowed to disembark, um, most of those passengers, almost all of them, would actually be quarantined at the dock. Um, and they would actually be quarantined in these rooms and have daily physical exams and be washed and, and everything like that for a period of time before they would actually be allowed to enter the country. Um, so border control and, and movement through these spaces and transportation were, you know, things that were used for mitigation even back um, in the 1850s and later. And then I have some other examples, you know, in the 1800s, um, mail bags were used to disinfect. This was a little bit of a later cholera pandemic um, in 1884. Um, they actually disinfected mail bags in the streets and things like that. So again, that, that use of space that wouldn't normally be used for that was used in a different way. And then again, um, passengers arriving at a destination would actually be fumigated as well, in addition to quarantine procedures that they'd have to go through. And, um, oh, the other thing I should mention actually with the cholera pandemic in New York City, um, that actually led to the New York City Board of Health to support the movement to create Central Park to improve the health of both physical and mental of the city's inhabitants. Um, and they also included in that park um, a reservoir in order to apply clean water to the city because cholera is waterborne. And so again, urban planning was, was greatly driven by um, the cholera pandemic that was happening. And then obviously a lot of people know the Spanish flu of 18, 1918 to 1920. Um, you know, that's estimated to cause the death of 50 million people worldwide. And, and just the impact of that on urban planning and, and things like that is probably unprecedented. In the U.S. alone, there was 675,000 deaths that, that we think, and there's probably higher than that. Um, and so the Spanish flu actually influenced architects and led to the belief that town planning should promote health. Um, and so that became a significant drive in some of these garden, um, tall garden city centers where um, people accessed uh, housing from not from the street like tenement. And that actually led to a public housing development as well. And it was actually considered to benefit health. Um, they actually had welfare checks at homes and things like that. And that was all coming out of the Spanish flu. And so public housing was designed as actually um, a health benefit. 
So looking at history, um, you know, through any pandemic, there's this consistent question, right, of how to manage personal relationships and crowds. Um, it's really easy, Scott's heard me use this phrase before, um, to build the, the, China, the wall of China, right? You put up this big brick wall <laughs> and don't allow anyone or anything to interact. It's really easy to control infectious disease when you do that. Um, but there's a lot of unintended consequences to that, and that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, and so you, you then come to how do you manage personal relationships and crowds. And so in order to think about how to manage them in an urban space, you have to understand what they are. So personal relationships, there's different kinds, right? You've got your family, your friends, partnerships, work relationships, any, any of those personal relationships you get um, in various parts of your life, they often rely on touch, eye contact, shared interests, and mutual experiences. And these mutual experiences often take place within an urban space. Um, you know, it's that you know, where do you go? You go to the bar with your friends, you, you know, you go and um, walk through the park, you go on a hike together, you, you know, there's a million things people do for experiences as part of that personal relationship. But a lot of people do this, um, which leads to crowds um, in an urban environment. And so these crowds are often people having that similar experience. And so another problem with crowds is so when you start thinking, what's the definition of a crowd? Um, and it's not an easy question to answer, actually, because it really depends on the um, on what your perception is, right? And so it can be a personal perception. You know, some people that are really big introverts, if they're in a party of 20 people, they feel they're in a crowd. Um, other people that are extroverts, you know, they're okay in, in front of 500 people and they don't consider that a crowd at all. Um, and then it has to do with your personal experience, um, what experience you are. You know, you could be with a thousand people in a concert and that's not really a crowd-ish to you, but if you're, you know, kind of up giving a speech in front of someone, your definition of crowd greatly changes. Um, and in the case of a pandemic, the definition of a crowd um, changes based on the epidemiology of the um, pathogen that we're talking about. And so these are really important things to keep in mind when you start talking about urban spacing and how you can incorporate personal relationships and manage crowds and the perception of the people in those crowds um, as you go through. So I didn't say I wouldn't mention COVID-19, um, but I'm not gonna talk epidemiology about it. Um, so the current COVID-19 pandemic is similar to the Spanish flu pandemic, um, just in the fact that it's an airborne pathogen. Um, and so an airborne pathogen is different than, example, the cholera pandemic, which is waterborne. Um, so an airborne pathogen makes things a little more complicated. Um, and that's led to, you know, all these um, changes to the definition of crowd. So, you know, depending on a few factors, um, currently a crowd is considered greater than about 10 people. Um, and that's non-household individuals. You know, if you would have said that, you know, six months ago to someone, oh yeah, you've got 12 people in that, you need to disperse, the cops are coming, you, people would have laughed and said, you're crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but this is the current definition of a crowd. Um, and so current, these current mitigations um, based on, you know, what the current definition of a crowd has greatly changed how people need to use and have used and will use and move through urban spaces. And part of it is just, you know, that whole six feet apart that's now ingrained in everyone's mind um, that's meant to reduce and minimize the transmission. Um, and so this led, you know, has led to stores making aisles one way. And then, you know, outside the store, you've got lines that go down the sidewalk where they've got taped off six feet apart and or it goes into a parking lot um, to keep you know, below the required capacity numbers. You've got barriers up, tape guidance lines on the floor um, or everywhere you go, both inside and out. Um, and so while these measures are necessary, to, um, designing urban spaces to be flexible and adaptive would allow control or guiding of crowds um, while keeping the thread of interpersonal relationships woven through a space. And so I think this is really important to keep in mind. So you know, we kind of see this a little bit. So people, when you come up to a glass barrier like this on the left-hand side, um, it's very difficult to have the same kind of relationship with someone as you would without all of the barriers and mitigations that are in place. Um, and it's just much harder to have those personal relationships. And we're actually seeing this in society now. Um, if you talk to people in customer service or things like that, people are, are becoming much more I guess angry is a good term, um, because they're losing that, that personal relationship with people. Um, and so that, that really plays a role into how you should think about using mitigations in urban spaces and how to design them to minimize that impact on personal spaces while you still control crowds um, and allow people to move through uh, spaces. And so people and governments um, have adapted, obviously. 
um, in different ways. Um, but again, the biggest thing that I want to say is you, care has to be taken in how mitigations are used and whether they're truly a tr being used for a critical control point whose benefits outweigh the potential unintended consequences. Because human contact is important and we have to be careful that we're not creating unintended disparities in different populations because of the mitigations that we're using. Um, you know, the robot on the left, um, Boston Dynamics, um, these are actually deployed in Singapore in parks right now, and they actually <laughs> um, are being used to make sure if people are too close together, those robots actually respond, and those robots actually have tasers on them as well. <laughs> um, and they are being deployed um, in the U.S. as well in the national parks. Um, they're being trialed at the moment. Um, Instacart, you know, that's the whole thing. People don't want to grocery shop anymore. They're, they're buying their groceries online and having them delivered to them. And that really changes, you know, what spaces are, are being used by people. Um, and when people do go into the community, again, you can see the circles on the sidewalk, some use circle chalk, some use tape, um, but these different uses of the space. And, you know, that doesn't work well if the sidewalk is really narrow and you've got multiple people trying to get by each other. So then you have people ending up, you see it with runners all the time where they start running into the street to go around someone. Um, so the, all things to be cons, um, considering. Um, and then again, it's, it's towns and cities have started to adapt um, to kind of take some of this in line because I realize that they need to start having relationships and things again, but how do you do that safely? And so, you know, individuals have started having, um, I kind of, what I, don't know the actual term people are calling but these kind of parking lot socials they're calling them <laughs> where people go to parking lots you know open up their tailgates and they usually most of them have a glass of wine or you know something or a beer in their hands as well and they're trying to get those personal relationships while maintaining you know kind of the social distancing crowd control within their own um kind of relationships, their own personal family and, and social uh, circles. Um, cities and towns are doing it. They're closing off roadways um, and allowing restaurants to use parking spots or half a road um, for outdoor seating. They're making sidewalks one way. Um, there's hand sanitizer stations being built in everywhere on the sidewalks. Um, so all these things are being designed. Some streets are being closed off entirely and turned into boulevards so that people can exercise with their kids and walk and be outside without having to worry about infringing on that quote six feet. Of distance. Um, and then I did put a picture of Central Park again, which was um, greatly driven by the cholera pandemic um, in giving that space um, to the people because green space is important, um, not just for the psychological benefit of having green space. Again, you see this in every pandemic. What does everyone do in a pandemic? not because it's right or because it's needed, but they flee to the countryside. And we've seen it, you've seen the, the stories of New Yorkers suddenly fleeing um, to surrounding you know, areas, um, to their vacation homes or things like that. Um, and it, it's not necessarily driven because it needs to be, but there's this innate perception that, that green means cleaner and healthier. Um, and so taking that into consideration when you design cities and how people will move through those spaces and having access to that will greatly change how people will um, use an urban space in an infectious disease setting and make them feel that the cities and um, areas, the urban spaces they're using are healthier in and of themselves. And they actually probably are, we all know they probably are both psychologically and and physically, but um, it's important consideration to make. Um, and so based on that, I want to thank you. Um, and again, there's, it's really exciting to know, you know, kind of what the outcome is going to be from this. There's going to be a lot of changes. Um, and I really think for me, the biggest thing is to incorporate designing mitigation into an urban environment where you don't make people feel that they're controlled or separated from each other. And there's absolutely ways to do this well. Um, and then that way you can guide people through safely and allow them to use spaces without making them feel controlled or separated or losing that connectivity to other people. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that the, the point about how to, how to create safer spaces without people realizing it, because I know a lot of times in the work that we've done together um, in terms of biosecurity uh, in a facility, you really try to make it a natural uh, circulation path, right? So people are doing uh, things that help maintain biosecurity without even realizing it. And I think that's a great point uh, about Central Park and other spaces. And I, I wonder, you know, sometimes as designers, um, we're gonna have a, a whole new approach to things that we do. I know we've had conversations about how you plan not only animal facilities or farm facilities, but you know, now office facilities in that way. So. I, it's a great, uh, great bit of information. So uh, thank you very much. Um, next we have uh, 
Gary Hack. And again, please post questions. Um, I will keep reading from your, your questions that you're posting. Um, so we're uh, on track pretty much here. We'll, we'll catch back up. Uh, Gary Hack, he brings over 40 years of experience in practice and teaching. Um, he's a, a planner uh, by trade. His, uh, his work is widely known and has done some, some pretty massive uh, planning exercises. So it's always, uh, as an architect, it's amazing to me to, to think of that shift of scale uh, to much broader topics like that. So he's uh, a great uh, resource for this and I'm looking really forward to getting some of your comments, Gary. Thank you, it's good to be uh, with you. And uh, if this uh, background behind me looks a little bit uh, strange, it's uh, because uh, I'm up in Maine for the summer where we always go and, uh, and uh, the hot spot in town is actually the parking lot beside the public library, which has decent internet service, uh, uh, whereas our, our homes don't. So, uh, so uh, stick with me on this. Um, uh, after being isolated for uh, almost uh, uh, 10 weeks and facing the prospect that we have another six months to go at least, um, it's probably a good thing to be to starting to talk about how we would live differently if we had a choice on it. And so uh, uh, I'm going to try to throw out a few ideas about that. Um, but it's also true that this is pretty early in the game and we don't actually know uh, how the virus spreads. Uh, not very much about it anyway. We don't know. Uh, there are plenty of guesses and hypotheses about what has caused local hotspots. And how people will react in the long term is uh, something that uh, we have yet to uh, figure out. Um, I'm going to try to talk about um, uh, three uh, subjects. One is density and, uh, and distance and how one uh, accomplishes that. The second is the um, new uh, revival of uh, localism, which I think is also coming as a result of the, uh, of the virus. And uh, the third is um, the rethinking of our streets uh, because uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's occurring naturally as a response to the, uh, to the virus, but it'll also have to, it means that we have to cope with some of the changes in our society that have occurred as a result of it. Next slide. Next, yep. Uh, so the first issue is density. And um, so, because uh, so many of the hotspots uh, in our cities seem to be in the more dense, older cities of the country, uh, many people have concluded that we need to get away from the high densities. People got to move out into the countryside as they did, and uh, as the previous speaker said, uh, into London. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, we will need to uh, begin thinking about how to de-densify our, our cities. Next. But a very interesting study came out last week, and it was, uh, it, it was done by the uh, uh, Citizen Housing and Planning Council in, in New York. And uh, what they uh, found in comparing the numbers on it was that, in fact, uh, density isn't correlated with, uh, with the presence of, uh, of uh, cases uh, or, or deaths of, of people. Uh, what they found was that density seems not correlated with high infection rates. Uh, internationally, New York is less dense than Seoul, Korea, but we have more than 300 times the number of cases per capita in New York. Uh, in the U.S., smaller communities have far higher uh, levels of, uh, uh, of uh, transmission of the disease uh, than in uh, larger cities. In the New York region, for example, Brooklyn is 20 times as dense as Rockland County, which is 45 miles to the north, but it is only twice as twice the number of cases as Rockland County, and so on. And so we don't know a lot about uh, why there are these large disparities, but the uh, first order uh, impressions that people have is that we've got to de-densify uh, seem not to be the case, uh, uh, not being held up by the, uh, the, the early data that we've got on this. Next. Uh, nonetheless, public officials have placed their bets on forcing people to keep a distance from others in the city. Having contact is one of the factors that draws people to large dense cities. That's why people are there. And so this, this inevitable conflict between the desire to be in contact and the, and the uh, 
at least the current uh, uh, theories that in fact it's contact that's causing the uh, the uh, viruses to spread uh, quickly is at the root of the problem we have to solve. Next. So if we were to spread that lunchtown crowd out that I showed you in, in Bryant Park, uh, it would be able to and, and put them all at uh, suitably uh, spread out distances from each other. The problem is that it would Bryant Park would accommodate about one third the number of people that it accommodates on a good summer day uh, today. And so uh, part of the issue we, we need to uh, address is how do we get the kind of uh, space that we desire to uh, get away from uh, intense work spaces in the office, uh, intense uh, housing uh, at the in a, in a city where we're, we're constrained in terms of what kinds of new spaces we can create. Next. So over time, we might be able to reorient, reorient our large structures to create large green spaces uh, in buildings rather than outside of the buildings. We know that uh, only about half the number of people with desks are present, uh, presently uh, are, are present in their uh, office space on any given day. Uh, and so, in fact, we could uh, uh, buy some of that space and use it for, uh, for uh, spaces for release and, and uh, places where uh, people can uh, socialize in the outdoor environment. And there are interesting examples, it seems to be tall buildings that are being done uh, with that kind of quality to them. Uh, next. Uh, there's also the, the fifth facade of every building, which is the roof, and uh, and there are plenty of uh, uh, possibilities. They can accommodate all kinds of activities, relying on uh, the lobby security to screen users uh, naturally as they're going into and from the buildings that they're, they're inhabiting. Next. And let me shift then to the second point. Uh, the quite understandable desire to create a cordon around residential areas to keep those who might threaten local residents, assuming that the enemy is not from within. Uh, one strategy is closing streets to through traffic. Uh, New York has, has closed over 100 blocks to through traffic uh, over the last several weeks to provide for local activities. Cities all over the world are adopting this as a strategy. Next. Of course, this is an old strategy, uh, and it, uh, it uh, is uh, uh, common in uh, places that are gated uh, uh, on it. But the problem with the gated community is that it really offers only one option. That is, it only offers the option of uh, being there uh, because you live there or because you've invited somebody into that space. And that, in fact, destroys a lot of what we think of as urbanity in our cities. Next. Others uh, argue that higher density communities uh, that have uh, higher density um, residential communities uh, that have more contact among uh, diverse groups are likely to have high uh, incidence rates. But that same study that I referred to earlier shows that low density communities of the New York region have higher infection uh, rates than the denser parts of the region. And the 10 uh, most infected uh, areas in the United States have far higher rates of infection uh, than uh, New York or boroughs. They all happen to be small communities in remote places on it. Next. I expect one of the responses to uh, the uh, virus is going to be that people are going to be looking for more complete residential communities, communities that have more of the weekly needs built into them uh, so that they can, they don't have to in fact go into public space in order to, uh, to uh, uh, accomplish the needs that they have. Uh, so uh, they offer the security of being able to uh, continue a way of life uh, within a compound during a pandemic, but easily to move out into public space in periods when there isn't a pandemic. And uh, sites will need to be larger in order to be able to uh, uh, accommodate, accommodate this full range of uh, new activities. Uh, this is a, an ordinary kind of residential development that seems to me to be quite terrific in the sense that it has all kinds of open space. It's available to the residents. It has recreation spaces, but it also has commercial spaces all around the perimeter of it so that people can use it, can get to them from the uh, housing area, but can also get to them from uh, other areas uh, around it. Next. 
Now, liberating streets is also uh, an important way to uh, uh, get the needed social distance in uh, outdoor restaurants and socializing areas. And what we're discovering over, as we look at all of these unused streets where people aren't driving on them these days, is that in fact, we're devoting an enormous amount of our city uh, to automobiles uh, that aren't uh, necessary to, uh, uh, to everyday life. And, um, and so uh, cities are looking for ways to take back that space and make it uh, a part of the uh, everyday uh, uh, living space of our communities. And this is producing a kind of localism, a new kind of localism that, that's uh, uh, resulting in, in people uh, discovering and sharing the space that's uh, around their uh, housing and, and their offices and other such uses. Next. Uh, Barcelona has done a very interesting thing uh, in, uh, in a residential area that all architects know because of its uh, grid-like uh, pattern on it. They've decided that they're going to close uh, many of the internal streets to, uh, to um, uh, traffic, uh, through traffic. And so they've taken nine block areas and they've uh, uh, stopped uh, through vehicles from going into them, allow uh, people who live there from going into them, but you can walk into these uh, spaces. And there are people who, uh, uh, you know, inspect who's coming and going at the perimeter of this. And uh, during a time of a pandemic, they would be there and other times uh, they need not be there. So this is a kind of flexible world where you get more space, but you don't uh, gate it in the sense that a gated community uh, does. Next. And this brings me to my third point, which is uh, uh, something that I've been feeling not only because of the pandemic, but because of all kinds of other things that are occurring. And that is that we need to start thinking of our streets differently in the future. We need to think of them as fluid places, places that can be reassembled and reused in different kinds of ways at different times of the day, at different times of the week, at different times of the year. Uh, and uh, this great sketch that uh, KPF did here uh, illustrates how a New York street could serve all multiple purposes rather than simply uh, having a, uh, a zone for uh, moving vehicles and a zone for walkers on the perimeter of it. Next. And I shift, uh, this, I think the shift to inter internet uh, ordering uh, the fact that uh, so many people are in fact living their lives by ordering everything they need on the internet uh, is also going to force us to think differently about how we use our streets. Uh, in the morning in uh, New York, you, you see the parade of uh, UPS trucks that uh, uh, are running uh, down the streets to their destinations. Then there's no place to uh, put things as they're being unloaded and delivered to the uh, houses around. And, uh, and, uh, and we have a, a mess. In, in the streets. And in fact, it's caused uh, um, the New York City to explore eliminating parking on one side of many streets uh, in order to be able to accommodate all the loading and unloading that's occurring. And I think this was happening anyway, but this has been accelerated greatly by the incredible move to uh, using the internet as your source of, of, uh, of goods and materials. Next. And there's going to be other things which are going to be accelerated as a result of this. Uh, uh, upper left, you see a uh, uh, autonomous grocery delivery uh, uh, vehicle that's being piloted in a few American cities. Uh, uh, Amazon is, uh, has its robots going on the streets now. Uh, uh, Uber and uh, the other uh, uh, car uh, services uh, need places for their vehicles to line up on the curbs waiting for the people that have ordered them. Uh, there are new kinds of uh, vehicles that are on the streets uh, uh, as well from uh, uh, scooters to uh, uh, electrified wheelchairs to all kinds of uh, kinds of new uh, uh, facilities. The effect of this is to cause us to rethink how streets work and uh, and I think that the virus is simply accelerating these trends. Next. And this is an example of a place where in London, they have actually gotten rid of curbs. Uh, they have uh, made the street flexible and they've made it so that it can work uh, in a uh, open mode and uh, uh, they can also be closed for festivals or events uh, in it. Uh, vehicles can use it at some times of the day and not at other times of the day. And it seems to me this is the kind of direction that we should be thinking about for many of our streets in our urban areas. Next. So in sum, 
Uh, density demands space for distancing and security. Uh, and uh, and uh, also uh, security about who's sharing your space. Uh, adding relief spaces within buildings is one avenue. Uh, grabbing back space from, uh, uh, from streets is another avenue to this. Uh, there are a whole lot of ways to get that additional space that we need. Uh, there's also a growing sentiment to exclude strangers from local spaces. And I think that in ways that I have shown here, we can, fi we can find uh, uh, ways that are maintain the openness of, uh, of urban communities, but also uh, give a level of security protection for people that are using them. And then finally, I think the shift to internet purchasing is going to have a huge impact on cities, not the least what happens to all that ground level commercial space that's sitting on the, on the streets at the moment. Uh, but we need to think of streets as having a fluid quality rather than a static quality. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Gary. You know, we got a, a question early on in your presentation about uh, from Mark um, Mark S. I know. I think I know who that is. But um, how does the panel anticipate profound changes to the way we uh, think of public space, or will it be more incremental and subtle? And it's interesting because in, in the end, there you 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 answered that question in a couple of ways, right? In terms of the autonomous vehicles, the idea of Barcelona the idea of package delivery. Do you want to expand on that? Well, these things are happening and they're going to cause a lot of irritation and that's going to be what's forcing the changes uh, on it. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I see in New York City a lot of streets that are being changed just uh, in incremental ways, taking uh, parking off one side, making it available for, for delivery vehicles and, uh, and uh, Uber cars that are picking people up on them, uh, uh, using, uh, uh, expanding out uh, uh, sidewalk restaurants into the streets uh, all over the place uh, in order to be able to get reasonable spacing between people and to get the benefits of being outdoors when you're dining uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in public on it. Uh, so these things are, these individual people are, are, are happening, I suspect it's going to be very difficult to change uh, the uh, streets that we're closing um, uh, to uh, through traffic uh, and allow through traffic back into those streets. So mm -hmm. the, the short-term experiments are going to be a step on a road to a long-term change. Well, it's funny because a, a, another question came in and this idea about um, the example of Barcelona and and the question has to do with South Philadelphia. And for our, our world, our global audience, uh, South Philadelphia is a little bit of the, the uh, Old West in terms of parking. So um, they tolerate parking in South Philadelphia like they would not anywhere else in the city. For instance, in the evenings, the entire center uh, aisle of the roads have cars in them, and it's sometimes two or three wide, and they never get a ticket versus anywhere else. If you're you know too close to anybody's driveway, you get a ticket anywhere else. So. Um, it's interesting that the example of Barcelona, the question that's asked, and this idea of, of being able to sort of create sub-districts within a series of blocks, right, and whether there'd be a tremendous backlash to that in your mind. Well, I don't, I don't think that you need to uh, eliminate all parking. I mean, obviously people need some parking, but uh, it would be nice to price the parking on its, at its real cost, which is the cost of that space that it's occupying. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the um, uh, places where they've tried to do that have, uh, you know, increased the price of, uh, of parking. They've found that a lot of people don't need to uh, be parking there. On it. You know, automobiles are used about 10 percent of the time for for travel the rest of the time they're just sitting somewhere we have seven parking spaces in our cities for every vehicle <laughs> and that those seven parking spaces are you know in uh, you know in shopping centers and and at work and at home and uh, uh, at schools uh, uh, and so on and so on and so uh, um, looking for a way by which we can reduce the number of uh, spaces that are city em sitting empty waiting for somebody to come there uh, is also a way to free up space uh, for other kinds of uses. Yeah, we have a, co I'm not sure if there's a question or a comment, but the, the notion of appropriating streets to facilitate pedestrian distancing makes sense. Uh, and there are great examples of that, Espanola Way, Lincoln Road in Miami, the Piazza in Philadelphia, and there are also unfortunate experiences that result from evicting cars from streets and urban spaces like Richard Allen Holmes and the Chestnut Street Transit Way. What lessons can we 
sort of utilize to reprioritize our urban space intelligently? That could go for anybody on the panel, I think. Yeah. Well, uh, the Chestnut Street experiment is, uh, uh, is actually the right idea at the wrong time, in my judgment. Uh, uh, it is a, it was, Chestnut Street was changing anyway, and uh, so everybody blamed it on stopping the cars from going down the street. Uh, uh, in fact, I don't think that's what caused the decline of Chestnut Street. But, the, uh, but I think we're going to have a very, one very large change is going to be the shift from big buses in cities to small micro buses and, and mini buses and autonomously run uh, by some buses that pick you up at your at your uh, place and uh, and drop you at your destination and you share it with there's essentially shared vehicles for with, uh, five or six people in them and uh, that's actually going to allow them to uh, function on uh, streets that are you know streets that are being used by pedestrians because mm -hmm. they won't hit the pedestrians they have you know it's their, they have programs that will stop them from doing that on it mm -hmm. and uh, if we if we start thinking about about uh, cities in those kinds of ways uh, you can have uh, buses you can have public transit going through streets that are mainly pedestrian streets right. and uh, uh, that, that'll make a big change yeah super thank you so much Gary very enlightening um, we're gonna uh, move on to our next uh, panelist Devin Liddell um, interesting uh, interesting gentleman he's the uh, uh, futurist who works collaboratively with clients such as Boeing Ford Intel, Nike, Panasonic, Starbucks, T-Mobile, Toyota Design, Preferred Futures in Aviation, Smart Cities, uh, Personal Mobility. Uh, super interesting guy. He's the, his, his job title is uh, Principal Futurist uh, for Teague uh, Consulting, which is a great title to have. I'd love to have that title. Um, and he also is a, a writer for uh, Fast Company. And that's how I, I ran across him. I was uh, um, thinking about these things and did some research and ran across one of his uh, uh, dissertations about Leonardo da Vinci and the idea of his notions of how the city could be organized in a vertical fashion uh, in a way, which I thought was very interesting. So um, with that, I'm gonna give you control, uh, Devin, and uh, look forward to uh, hearing your comments. Thanks so much, Scott. Yeah, actually, while I'm pulling this up too, the, uh, it's interesting to think back on that Da Vinci piece because that was pre-COVID-19. Um, but of course, Da Vinci himself was inspired by the bubonic plague in Milan um, to, uh, to actually think about those things. So um, there's a relationship there. Let's see. The, I'll just start here. The, if you're a science fiction fan, you'll recognize this image uh, from the film Blade Runner 2049. Uh, a lot of my work is focused on urban mobility. So it's the flying car here that I'm really interested in. And especially because the spinner, that's what it's called in, in the, uh, the film's mythology, is noticeably more rugged than the version of the same vehicle in the original 1982 Blade Runner film. And it's become more rugged because of the harshness of the environment. Um, so this is a marker. This is, in my opinion, this is a marker. This is an example of, of how something familiar will remain familiar and nonetheless be, be recognizable as having changed in some sort of before and after way. And the same will be true, in my opinion, of COVID-19. And this has come up in, in one of the Q&A questions already, um, whether this will be dramatic or subtle. I think there will be a lot that will be very familiar um, in terms of our public spaces, but nonetheless, they'll, they'll have changed in noticeable ways. Um, just as one corollary um, that might invite some debate later on is that if you look at our aviation-focused spaces, there is a before and after a similar marker as it relates to uh, the events of 9-11. So we recognize what it was like to fly before 9-11, and then there are different things in place after 9-11, even though the, the actual experience of flying is actually very familiar. The other thing that I'm interested in when it comes to um, what the impacts of this will be are sort of our, what I would describe as sort of like our urban interfaces. Um, so some good examples of likely transformations to the familiar are some of these like really common interfaces within public spaces. One of those interfaces is lines. Um, how we actually queue up for various things. These are especially pervasive in transportation-based spaces, of course, um, such as the security checkpoint at an airport. And uh, kind of riffing on what Barbara mentioned earlier, you can see that this interface in particular is the antithesis of social distancing. It's the antithesis of physical distancing, um, even if that physical distancing only needs to be a temporary measure. 
So at the same time, solving for this interface problem requires an entire rethinking of the space. So this is actually an example of maybe where it will be more dramatic. You can't just put down vinyl dots in an airport on the floor because the, the sheer numbers of the passengers will actually overwhelm a, a, a system like that. Another interface that we're going to have to wrestle with, and actually we're already wrestling with it, um, is uh, it's more literal, and that's actually touch screens. Um, the, we can add to that mix like probably any remaining push-pull doors in our public spaces. <laughs> There's fewer of them out there. Um, but touch screens are pretty pervasive in a lot of our spaces. And this is something that, has, that actually has changed even in the last couple months. Um, a colleague of mine argued that there's been five years of innovation to, uh, in this space compared or in the last five months. Um, and it really comes down to like, in a, to kind of put it bluntly, in a post-COVID-19 world, we're just not going to want to be jammed up next to strangers and then we're not going to want to have to touch the things that they just touched. That's what it comes down to. Um, the other one, and, and uh, this, is, this, this robot is not weaponized like the one that Barbara showed. Um, I am fascinated by the one that Barbara showed, which I've seen as well. Um, but because of our desires to minimize interactions with strangers and touch as little as possible, it comes down to automation in public spaces has a pretty bright future. So we should expect the proliferation of drones and robots in particular. And uh, this image is from the International Airport in Doha, in Qatar. Uh, and it's a sanitization robot that just entered service. So this is actually in place right now. Um, it roves common uh, spaces and walkways and uh, works to sanitize those spaces. Um, there are also UV light sanitization drones being tested in a lot of places. Um, it's worth noting, by the way, that, that this trend, and this is something that Gary touched on, this trend toward automation and all the resulting robots and drones was already in motion in a lot of transit-based spaces uh, before COVID-19. So just as one example, um, North American ARP airports make about 40% of their revenue from paid parking. Um, which is another subject that's come up. Um, and that revenue has been slowly eroding uh, by mainly through ride hailing services. Um, that will eventually fall to zero. The revenue from paid parking will eventually fall to zero. One solution to that revenue problem is actually to make up for the shortfall through automation in labor savings. So essentially to have more and more robots and drones doing the jobs of people inside airports that we don't have to pay. And that's how we will make up for some of those shortfalls in paid parking revenue. One quick, by the way, design note um, that's a, a little bit of a problem when we think about the, uh, the future public life of drones and robots is that there are lots and lots of cute robots, minus the, the weaponized one that Barbara showed, um, that, but there are lots and lots of cute robots, but there are no cute drones. So we actually have to solve for the, the cute problem when it comes to drones. <laughs> uh, this image right here, whoops. We're also like this, likely to see the proliferation of a lot of uh, cameras and sensors in our public spaces. So essentially like in particular mobility, urban mobility kind of becomes a new uh, surveillance state. Um, and surveillance can be really problematic from a privacy standpoint, but it, it also can have some benefits. So what you're seeing here in this image is a, a future subway passenger benefiting from some transparent metrics about how clean the subway car is based on data about how recently it was cleaned and how many other people have been in it or are, are in it. Um, so this is actually a benefit or potential benefit of, a, of sort of, of the proliferation of cameras and sensors in our public spaces. I mentioned the, the vinyl dot problem uh, or showing the, the, the jammed queues inside of an airport. Um, with those interfaces. And what we're likely to see as a result of this is what I would argue is sort of the stretching of spaces beyond their physical footprints. So the way that this will happen is by decentralizing processes outside of those spaces. This image is from an, an advert from the future touting the ability to go through security screening 
while in transit to the airport. So rather than at the airport, meaning that you're likely to go through TSA screening at your hotel or at your local Starbucks or eventually in an autonomous car. So the lines, if there are any, will actually be pushed off site, will be pushed outside of the, the, the physical footprint of the space itself, um, somewhere other than the airport. This, by the way, is another example of something that is has already been underway. Uh, I, I live in Seattle and the SeaTac airport that, that serves me actually already operates at 40% over capacity. So that airport is already having to wrestle with the, the notion of pushing processes off-site um, and something like COVID-19 will actually only accelerate those, uh, those issues. And this is my last image. Um, I mentioned uh, automation and, and surveillance, um, but there is a, a considerable underbelly to those those uh, those trends. Um, those transform spaces will be definitely more efficient and and arguably more safe. Um, but I'd also argue that they'll be low on empathy. They uh, they'll then and they might even make us more anxious. To be honest, um, this will be especially true if you are a person who experiences what I would argue is sort of like an anomaly within the system. So as examples, like if you're pet is misrouted in an airport, um, or I think maybe even more importantly, if you don't personally conform to the expectations of the system. And this is already a major problem for people who use wheelchairs um, and also transgender travelers in particular. And those are just a few examples. So this image is, is also from Doha, which is rolling out the robots. Uh, and it shows airport staff wearing what they call smart helmets. And these smart helmets actually allow the, these people to passively screen passengers for fevers. So what we're not seeing in this image is what they're seeing, which is a, is a temperature readout of, of passengers as they walk by them. So rather than actually having to sort of swing by and, and interrupt someone, they can actually do this fairly passively. Um, and that's, that's an impressive functionality, but the optics for passengers, I'd argue, is a bit terrifying. Um, so if our public spaces are transformed by automation and surveillance, we're going to have to figure out ways, and this is really important moving forward, we have to figure out ways to, to design for empathy in those spaces, to actually bring back some of the humanity that we actually count on in those spaces. Because you can see from an image like this, it's a, it's a bit imperiled. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. Uh, you know, it's really interesting, Devin. I think, it, you know, what are the unintended consequences of automation and surveillance, right? And I think um, one of the questions that came in was like facial recognition in a time of masks, right? What does that become, for instance, right? It's really uh, fascinating. Yeah, actually, just to touch on it real quickly, the um, one of the unintended consequences that I worry about when it comes to uh, automation and in particular surveillance is uh, ushering in potentially an unintended new era of segregation in transportation. Meaning that if you give people the ability to sort of look into ride hailing or ride sharing cars, look into even subway cars and light rail vehicles, um, you might end up with a scenario where people want to travel with people who only look like them. And we end up with an unattended uh, era of segregation uh, reemerging in, in transportation. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, those are great things that we should be talking about so we don't find ourselves in another quandary as a society. Very important issues. Um, great conversations. We're going to move on. Um, our final speaker today is Jerry Sweeney, um, who is, uh, I consider a friend. I hope he does the same. He's... Um, He's a pretty amazing uh, person overall. He's a president and CEO of Brandywine Realty Trust. Um, he took uh, Brandywine from basically owning, I think it was like four properties uh, and to, to growth of over 28 million square feet and a total market capitalization of over $5 billion. Um, and so with all of that, you'd expect this to be a, a, a huge man that's focused on business and the bottom line. But every interaction I've had with Jerry, it's been really about the people um, and that's why I thought it'd be perfect for this panel. The idea that, that you can be both a good human and a good business person uh, is really strong. So I'm going to uh, turn the controls over to you, Jerry, and, um, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, that's great. Uh, Scott, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you for including me in the panel. A lot of, uh, a lot of br gr uh, great brain power and excellent ideas and commentary. Uh, I, I think in terms of, uh, let me see if I get a slide to work here. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of overview comments uh, before I kind of really walk through the slides. I think they're, they're fairly germane. 
Uh, I mean, look, as a company, you know, Brandywine has always believed that physical spaces can help define our culture, signal our future, and I think as David really pointed out very well, provide a window into our past. And I think our approach has always been that if it's done correctly, they can create, you know, physical spaces can create new realities, uh, redefine cities, uh, spur the imagination, foster areas of reflectivity that really lead to a uh, creative thought. So we believe, and I think why this, why the topic of today's uh, uh, session is so good, is we believe that public spaces are really the connective tissue that bind us all together. And I think, uh, certainly as Barbara touched on, I think, you know, never really, at least in, in our lifetimes, has the, the search or the need for connective tissue been more important. And we've all spent, as we are today, countless hours on go-to meetings, Zoom meetings, conference calls, uh, looking at uh, slides, uh, looking at newly minted beards, longer hairstyles, trying to figure out what's in people's background, uh, and then waiting for that moment when we can all chime in and hopefully add some value. And I think as, as the weeks have gone by, we all know that that's not connective tissue. I mean, that's really emotional triage wrapped in the cloak of productivity and base economic necessity. I mean, how many of us have really gone out to try and find, uh, walk outside, walk along the river trail, go to a park because of that need to connect, whether we connect with other people safely, uh, connect with the broader surroundings of, of nature, or really just connect with ourselves. Uh, and I think as Barbara touched on with the level of frustration people are having, uh, you know, those, that need to connect really drives human nature, drives our behavior, and is a really important part of our mental health. And I think that need to self-actualize and elevate our thoughts just above the survival instincts has really been very sorely tested uh, during this very tragic experiment. And we believe uh, from a development standpoint that many components of the urban habitat, as Gary touched on, are really being tested. Uh, but we remain convinced that, you know, good design predicates will wind up being validated and reinforced as we emerge from, the con from, the, from this process. So, you know, we've had a unique window because several of our large scale developments are really being, are taking place in what are still viewed as somewhat pioneering locations. So, so kind of as such, we learned that while we could build really well-designed, hyper-efficient buildings, the real test of their success is not just what's inside the walls, but rather what's outside. Uh, the place where they're located, the, uh, the neighborhood they sit in. And uh, while many developments take place in established locations, uh, we actually had a kind of, as many of ours do, we had a kind of a neat window to look at established versus pioneering locations. Uh, and uh, I think as, uh, as things progressed, uh, we really started to focus on this whole concept, as, as, and David's touched on it, and so is Gary, this concept of kind of a medieval village. Uh, and one of the basic building blocks was really the integration of uses in those small villages. Uh, rarely did you have, uh, you know, one use in a specific place. You really had a mix of, uh, of uh, residential, uh, commercial, uh, all joined together by common public spaces that were either act where civic activities took places, a need for socialization, trade. Uh, and we really started to take that to heart as we started to think about what creates a good design predicate in some of those areas that we were talking about. And it really came down to, you know, really looking at the neighborhood itself. Uh, so on this slide here, uh, you know, uh, many cities for a number of years uh, had that neighborhood concept. And then some of them did migrate into the establishment of these, you know, segregated uses. I mean, think about central business districts. Uh, those of you who are familiar with Philadelphia, think about Market Street West in the, the late, uh, the, you know, the, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, early in the 20th century. It, it was, a, it was a, a canyon of high-rise office buildings. And I think as we've learned, the, the lack of vibrancy, uh, 
the lack of, uh, of, of durability really has forced a lot of us to move back to more integrated design concepts. Uh, so we really learned, I think, over the years by looking at where mistakes have been made from a planning process that we really wanted to try and create that medieval village in modern times. And, th and that was really one of the points that the right side of the slide really shows our, uh, uh, our, first, our, our first really vertical neighborhood uh, that uh, took place around 30th Street train station in, uh, in University City. Uh, it was done in concert with the University of Pennsylvania. But, but that really laid into a combination of, of a whole range of uses, student housing, residential market rate apartments, hotel, offices, retail, parking, but all adjoining a one acre public park that was uh, built by Brandywine. And from the lessons we learned, we knew that to be truly great, outstanding architecture has to be some has to be part of something larger than just its own statement and the idea of being having a piece of architecture be part of a neighborhood not just a standalone building became very very important to us so as we kind of learned with uh uh with sierra green uh which is the town square as you would call it of, of sierra center south that's a one acre park sits 11 stories above street level. Uh, it's organized around a stormwater system, a stormwater management system to really effectively deploy uh, resources within the complex. It has folded plains, hardscape surfaces, lawn areas, dog park, uh, seasonal restaurant. We run farmer's markets up there, a lot of programming, exercising. And what's really become is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of the, the common element that binds a lot of those uses together. And the uses we get there are even amazing us as we go through each passing month. Uh, uh, so it's really been adopted by not just folks who are in the Sierra Center South complex, but even more importantly, the adjoining neighborhoods. Uh, and for us, it serves not just a gathering space, but really a harbinger of, of uh, along with our other park up at Drexel Square at Schuylkill Yards, of our objective being not just to build a collection of buildings, but to really curate a neighborhood and to really make sure that over time, those uses, uses blend seamlessly together so that you don't think of it as a collection of this building or that building, but it really becomes part of the urban fabric. And I think from our perspective, you know, the resiliency, the vibrancy and the durability of a neighborhood far outweigh what can be achieved simply through the through the act of, of creating a series of buildings. Uh, the, the next slide really just shows some quick examples of how you know, we and a lot of other folks in the development business are really incorporating gathering spaces as part of our overall development plans, uh, ranging from specific areas where people can gather to really, in a lot of our new developments, kind of bringing the outdoor in and the indoor out to kind of make that transition seamless uh, so that people feel comfortable whether they're enclosed or out in the open air. The, 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 uh, uh, so the, the two shots on the left are, is a mixed use project we're contemplating in, in the city of Philadelphia, actually working with Scott's firm on it, that really does create that mixed use community uh, in a fairly small footprint, but it's right in the middle of an emerging neighborhood. So there's a lot of other things outside of the walls of that complex that add value to what we're trying to do. Uh, the, the picture on the left is really two towers of a uh, very large, uh, the six, seven million square foot development we're doing down in Austin, Texas, which is, uh, will be the city's first transit oriented development. So we're working in a public private partnership with the transit authority. We're dedicating uh, 10 acres of the just close to 60 acres of space in that development to parks and recreational facilities. We will tie those parks into 23 miles of pedestrian jogging, walking, and bike routes to make sure that as that project uh, uh, rolls forward in its evolution, it's really viewed as an intrinsic part of the fabric of that entire part of Austin. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, to the heart of the matter, and there's been a number of slides put up here on different types of public spaces. But uh, I was reading an article in, uh, that was published in the, in the, in the, uh, 
uh, the Project for Public Spaces, which was an article done by a gentleman named uh, Phil Myrick, who really put forth a pretty good case that public spaces will be a central part of the path forward. I think Gary touched on that uh, uh, in, in terms of how he was looking at kind of reconfiguring existing infrastructure. Uh, and I agree with that. And I think that's why we put such a great emphasis on public spaces. Uh, you know, uh, public spaces, as I was alluding to earlier, whether you took a walk on the river trail on the Schuylkill River, whether you went to visit a park, you walked outside, they become kind of our beacon of hope, our release, our outcome, our way to connect and do that in a socially responsible way. So I think as we, as we laid out here, two interesting examples of where parks, plaza, even streets have an opportunity to really accelerate our reentry. You know, on this slide on the, on the right hand side is a, is a privately financed five acre park in Brooklyn, Domino Park. And as, as we saw other examples, you can really create an, an easily adaptable program for safe social distancing where these folks can gather in a safe way. I, I thought the, the, the picture on the left was pretty interesting. It's a hedge maze park uh, under design by an Austrian based uh, design studio, Preck that creates a 20 minute walking trail that's separated by three foot wide hedges to really ensure social distancing. Now, whether it actually is feasible or not, but it shows how this type of crisis is really testing all of our imaginations in terms of how we can forward plan, not just the reentry, but making sure that reentry is durable and is something that really winds up uh, addressing everyone's near-term safety concerns, but then also meets that higher need we all have to self-actualize by finding ourselves and communing with other people. Uh, so, I mean, so, to, to really kind of wrap up, uh, cities, and this is I really, cities like people, I really do believe, are very resilient. Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to get Barbara's comments on how, you know, the impact of some of these pandemics over time. Uh, but the ability for people to cohabitate, uh, to socialize, to interact, to share ideas, I think has only been heightened by this place we've been for the last 10 weeks of looking at computer screens. We all have that need to really have that face-to-face -face interface. So from, from uh, as we view it, uh, there's no doubt that this historic importance of public spaces is being accelerated and amplified in this need to connect the urban fabric. And whether it's rethinking how streets are, are managed, whether it's assessing traffic flows, package deliveries, as was pointed out, uh, we're now on the edge. You know, we now have an amazing opportunity to kind of really think about the right answers here. And I think the decisions that thought leaders like folks on this call uh, and, and public policymakers will make will be incredibly important and will be very seminal in terms of their impact going forward. So we have to rethink how public spaces are used. Uh, we have to rethink why public spaces aren't defined as essential infrastructure. Uh, because that's really what they are. I um, mean, it's fascinating to me that over a dozen states in this country have already declared public spaces as essential services, which really portends, I think, some forward thinking. So we've all got to get together and think about how we bring Main Street outdoors. You know, for the, the, the public spaces Brandywine's involved in, we're testing the limits of our own imagination in terms of how we can rethink their adaptability. A lot of folks are unemployed. Job fairs with Professional photographers was a great idea. One of our folks at bringing people in, and letting them do link ups to their uh, to their resume right there. But you know the, the things we've always done: the outdoor movies, the, the the art shows, the fitness classes, the farmers markets. They're just the they're just the the beginning of the thought process. We need to connect the dots. Know that we know that outdoor spaces are healthy. We know they're good for us. Uh, we now know that safety is a primary concern. So I would just close with, with encouraging everyone as we think about design going forward, think about urban planning predicates, that we test our own imagination and really explore the horizons of, of how we can use public spaces, not just use them, but frankly, how we fund them and how we maintain them. So we don't wind up in a situation where our public spaces, which are probably the most important things, are the least taken care of. 
So it, from as a real estate developer, you know, it's encouraging for, for, uh, for us to see that so many private development companies like a domino park uh, are taking the lead in creating privately financed public parks, public spaces, because we know intrinsically from a values perspective that that drives durability of, 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 uh, of, of the project success and it creates the resiliency to make sure that the income that we expect out of those properties is really durable. So, so thank you very much. Oh, that was great, Jerry. Thank you. You know, just a follow-up question on that, this idea of resiliency. I think um, you, I know Brandywine runs a lot of programs that are based on education. Like you mentioned, this idea of a, of a fair to help people with their resumes, photographs like that. What can we as industry and business leaders do to promote resiliency in the city beyond that? Well, look, I, th I think it, it runs the gamut of a whole, a whole range of broader based issues that are far beyond the scope of, of this discussion uh, in terms of, you know, equitable distribution of wealth, uh, promoting effective job growth. Uh, I mean, cities are fiscal animals and they need revenues uh, to make sure that there's, an, there's the capacity to equi equitably allocate resources. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, coming out of this, we all have a great opportunity uh, because we are in uncharted territory, uh, certainly as Devin touched on, uh, and I think it gives us all the, the chance to rethink the status quo. I mean, I know we, we, Brandywine's been involved in a lot of discussions uh, in Philadelphia, as well as Austin, Texas, on you know, how we can participate in facilitating economic and social growth in those cities going forward. Uh, so I think the first step is really open your mind. The second step is, you know, understand what the, what the predicates are that re should remain and what the status quo factors are that should be discarded. And then, frankly, the third element is really engage. I think if there's anything this isolation has taught us all is the need, that we, is the need to be proactive in how we engage. Uh, and my hope is that coming out of this, everyone will be so glad to get back to seeing people that the, there'll be hyper engagement, hyper creativity, and that can translate into probably some more thoughtful public policy in some of these cities. That's great. Um, I got some, we have a backlog of questions here. I'm going to pose a couple to the group and we're just about out of time, but a couple questions from Europe. Uh, I think one from uh, Francis talking about you know, the USA has not really embraced public transportation. Um, how do you think the government will focus on this? Will they focus on this with, with intent? Or is that too big of an ask? And I think that ties into a, a, uh, a question, which I'm guessing is from further north in Europe, you know, and how do you feel about city design and public um, transportation when the idea of trying to avoid crowds is one of the solutions uh, to the, the current pandemic? And I, I throw that out to the group, whoever wants to take one or part of that? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that's quite obvious, both in the way we're living now and the way that I think we can foresee in the future, <clears throat> is that we'll become more of walking, more like what the walking cities of the past. Um, that I think that the, um, the pedestrian city has a great future. And it's important to remember that the, you know, the the internal combustion engine city um, was not, you know, what we think of as the internal combustion engine city was really not designed for the internal combustion engine. Um, and that there's a kind of natural, you know, we have an infrastructure that's designed uh, for slower, uh, slower, short, slower rate of travel, shorter distances traveled. Um, I think that's really quite, you know, that's a comfortable, that the, there's a comfortable good fit between the cities we, have physically and that and that kind of future. Yeah, and I think Gary, you addressed one of these questions in the chat. I'm not sure if the uh, the questionnaire was able to see it, but maybe talk about this idea about. I think you referenced the idea about uh, this the size in your lecture about the size of vehicles, buses, things like that, mm -hmm. relative to people crowd control or trying to minimize uh, large groups. So the uh, you have to think of uh, mass transit as having you know a, a whole spectrum of possibilities on it. Uh, large scale mass transit, I mean real mass transit, where you're hauling large numbers of people. Uh, you know, in China, every mass trans transit system requires you to go through security to get on it. 
Yeah. It's just accepted. I mean, they just have a, as you go, you know, they have a, they scan your, your stuff that you're carrying on and all the rest of it. Uh, I can believe that, in fact, we'll have scanners that will be able to deal with many of these issues, whether it's taking people's temperatures, they go through or other kinds of things like that. Uh, Barbara probably knows a lot more about that than I do uh, on it. But that's at one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is, a, I think, the... Uh, the uh, emergence of smaller vehicles of five and six person uh, minibuses, 10 person minibuses, things like that. And, and on those, uh, um, first of all, it's a lot easier to uh, ensure that they're, they're sanitary that you're getting into. Uh, and uh, and uh, second, uh, you see the people that are joining you in that, in that place. And, 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 uh, and often they're being picked up from one district of a city so you're you know you know some of those people that are that are getting on and getting off at the moment the, what we have is a lot of intermediate scale stuff big buses street cars other kinds of things like that you don't know the people who are getting on it's not easy to sanitize them or deal with them and uh, it's we don't have any system by which you can uh, put people through security to get onto them etc and so i think we're going to have some sorting out of what kinds of transit modes that we have i don't think we're going to lose the large mass transit but i think we're going to have a lot more security on them mm. uh on it and uh, what we are going to do is gain a lot of smaller vehicles which are much more easily uh, dealt with yeah thank you one thing yeah. just Real quickly, just to add to that, that I think is a sort of a, an emerging conflict that is going unanswered so far, is answering the question definitively, who is going to be the operator of these networks? And the reason I mention that is that cities in broad brushstrokes see people as citizens and private operators see people as consumers. And there are problems within, within the differences between those two. And if you just look at uh, bike sharing, just as one quick example, you've seen bike sharing rise and fall in a lot of cities around the US, um, mainly along the whims of venture capitalist interests. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that, that question of who, who is the operator being answered more definitively as we move forward. Sorry, Barbara. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I don't think mass transit is going away, and um, but I think how we potentially use it is going to change, and previous panelists have spoken to this a little bit. Um, you know, some of that security screening is already done in other countries. Um, it's not just a physical security. It's not for, like, weapons, but your temperature is taken. Um, in Africa, this was done during the Ebola um, outbreak. Um, you didn't get on an airplane or a bus without having your temperature taken, for example, um, and that's done currently as well. Before you fly, you <laughs> some some places now you not only have to have a temperature taken, but you have to have a negative um, a PCR test showing that you're not currently infected um, when you disembark. And so I think some of that is going to be implemented. Um, you know, in China and in some Asian countries, you know, you see how many people wear masks on, on public transit, even when there's not a pandemic. Um, and so some of that will probably become part of our culture. Um, it'd be really fascinating to me to see what we adapt and what uh, adopt and what we don't. Um, but there's ways to, to absolutely still use public transport in a safe manner. It's just how you do it and approach it. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Jerry has a couple questions on the board here that uh, maybe you could answer. So I'll read them both here. So um, Jerry, with so much existing office product in our market being older, how do you see them being retrofitted and repurposed, et cetera? And the second question is, um, you know, with this desire to create open space, how how can developers be incentivized uh, to create open space, right? When that's not always, you know, you're doing it uh, for, for reasons about making place making, but how do we incentivize developers that aren't so interested in making public spaces uh, through the development process? Hey, 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 Scott, with the first question related to kind of retrofitting of existing buildings. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's uh, that's that's a, a massive undertaking, and we've uh, we have spent probably the be the better part of the last couple months really looking at that. Uh, and I think there's going to be different classes of what can be done. I think on, you know, all of our pending new developments, uh, we have gone back to our our design teams uh, and asked them all individually, uh, and then we combine collectively the comments of what they see as the important design elements that we need to factor in. Uh, and again, I think it's, it's pretty early in the process, uh, but you know, certainly uh, uh, you know, 
the HVAC systems need to be uh, upgraded significantly. And we, we've already rolled over to MERV quality filters in all of our buildings. Uh, we're looking at HEPA filters in some of the buildings. We're looking at the incorporation of uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, technology to, to do things from a cleaning and sanitizing standpoint. <clears throat> We're working with a couple of elevator companies to provide uh, where we have destination dispatch elevators where you still need to touch that pad, that keypad that Devin was talking about. You know, there's technology available now to have it done off your iPhone or your, and, your, and your, your building security code. So when you walk into the building, uh, you can just wave your security code. That knows what floor you have access to. It kind of tells you what, what floor to go to. Uh, so there's a lot of basic things from a social distancing standpoint we already incorporate into our buildings, but I think it's it's a brave new territory in terms of, of redesigning. We're we're now for the first time really thinking about operable windows in our office buildings, and it has impacts on energy modeling. And there's a lot of conflicting data points, uh, but uh, you know smaller lobbies, uh, larger, faster elevators. Uh, in some of our non-high-rise buildings, uh, putting in a couple of extra stairwells, some on the exterior of the building. Uh, uh, so I, I think there's a lot of those moving pieces, uh, but we've taken on that challenge to really understand that people come into our buildings really need to understand uh, that it's a safe, secure environment. So we've, we've surveyed all of our tenants to find out what's important to them. Uh, it's actually interesting when we talk about uh, mass transportation and cars, uh, the number one request we got from all of our tenants in the city of Philadelphia when they're coming back to work is can we provide parking for them? We're a very large owner of parking. And I think that dovetails into the concern, at least near term, of how mass transit uh, is, is, is used by people as we start to come back. And I think that that's going to have a bigger impact in Philadelphia than maybe some other cities mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, 40 percent of the workforce in Philadelphia commutes outside the city to work. And the percentage of people who work in the city, a big percentage of those come from outside the city. So unlike a number of other cities that have, don't have that level of, 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 uh, of dichotomy of where people live versus where they work, it's gonna be a big issue in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, which is a great reason for the uh, sort of the vertical city, right? This idea that getting back to even David's comments about the, a city was designed to be a smaller um, sort of thing that you traverse across as opposed to these wide expansive spaces. And to point out that carbon emissions are down 17%. Global. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> can I ask you, a, can I ask you a question? Uh, uh, with all of this uh, work from home that's been going on for the last number of months, uh, uh, and the sense that some people have that, that some of it's going to continue, do you think it's going to have an impact on the amount of office space that's occupied and, uh, and what kind of off office space people are looking for? Yeah, Dave, I think, look, that, that's, that's the, the, the truly relevant question. I think uh, the, the, the data points we're sifting through now are, you know, there already had been a fairly active work from home trend where, as, you know, a certain percentage of people were, were, were accustomed to working from home and had flexibility from their employers. Certainly this pandemic has truly accelerated the, uh, the, uh, the, the deployment of techno technological tools, these digital tools to enable people to do that. Uh, so I don't think there's any question that that will have a lingering impact on uh, near-term demand drivers. Counter counterbalancing that though, is that there had been this huge press over the last decade for densification of space. So the average square feet per employee had gone from 250 per, 250 square feet per employee down last year to about 190 square feet from employee. So one of the big questions we're getting from a lot of our tenants now is how we can modify their existing workspaces to provide for more social distancing. So the, the, the significant uptick, Gary, in co-working, uh, bench seating, uh, that certainly seems to be going by the boards. And we're even, uh, we're talking to a lot of our customers who are talking about keeping a percentage of their workforce on a rotating work from home basis. They're keenly focused on wider circulation corridors, uh, specific directional flow, uh, more space between, uh, between workstations, uh, uh, vanity panels between those workstations, 
the trend back to more enclosed office spaces. We're actually hearing from a lot of our tenants, they plan on bringing back people who, uh, you know, their employees who have their own offices much faster because they see their office kind of a secure environment. So I think there's, there's so much dissonance in terms of what the requirements are. Uh, or will be in terms of how many people will work from home. I've had a couple of interesting observations made uh, by uh, by some of our major customers. One is that uh, a lot of what the economy has been doing the last 10 weeks is effectively revenue maintenance. You're trying to deal with existing customers. You can't really develop new business relationships on the phone or on the computer. So there's this need to kind of get back out and start having face-to-face contact. Mm -hmm. The other interesting observation was made by a major employer was with the dislocation in the labor markets, uh, a number of employers are gearing up for uh, staff rotations. In other words, the labor market's been so tight the last several years that when they've uh, advertised for filling job openings, they may have had to compromise their standards on who they bought in. Now, with the, with the wide range of uh, folks out there looking for, uh, for employment, they look to, uh, to start a more active staff rotation plan. And as they've told me, to do that, to help define the culture of their company, they need space. They can't hire somebody and never meet them. Uh, they've got to bring them in. They've got to have them work with the team. So I, I think uh, we've started to look at, uh, at a number of things. I think near term, there's certainly going to be, I think, a muted uh, uh, construction pace for new office until we see some of these things shake their way through, Gary. Uh, yeah. uh, and I think we're trying to get ahead of the curve by really thinking forward with our architectural teams, what, what we should be thinking about today as we start to contemplate new space design or new building construction. Yeah. Yeah. I can say I've done some of that work in current buildings, um, looking at the, the flow through the buildings, changing which door is your, your, entry, your primary entry point, um, how people flow through that building, they use the space, um, things like that become really important. Um, and I, I always caution too, people, they like to think only in, in SARS-CoV-2, but um, when you're thinking of the design or how you're changing the use of a space, um, you don't want to get pigeonholed into a specific bacteria or virus, right? Because we don't know what the next one is. This is the first coronavirus pandemic in recorded history. Um, SARS didn't count. It wasn't a true pandemic. Um, and MERS-CoV-2, it MERS is um, only in the Middle East currently. Um, and so again, but looking at that flow through spaces and use of spaces is really important. And, and you can really make an impact from an infectious disease standpoint with little changes in just how people flow through a space and use a space. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting stuff. It's fascinating. We could talk for hours on this. We're about 15 minutes past our allotted time. So I don't want to uh, uh, take up any more time for you guys, which are, are extremely busy folks on here. So um, unless there's a, a burning closing comment that someone would like to make, perhaps our dystopian friend, uh, Devin. Um, uh, I, I think we'll probably uh, end it here. Um, I, I thank David uh, Brownlee, uh, great guest, uh, Barbara Jones, Gary Hack, Devin Liddell, and Jerry Sweeney. It was an honor to talk with you guys, and it's an honor to know you, and, and Devin, your new friend now. So I appreciate that. Um, it's been great. I also want to thank um, Heather Spray from uh, the National um, – uh, the national headquarters and also Janine Lamarca for helping put all this together. And for all you folks online across the world that have, uh, you know, it was an optional donation for this thing. And we've, we've raised uh, quite a bit of money here. And I just wanted to uh, give a shout out and thank you for that. The donation, you'll be able to donate up to eight o'clock and those um, donations will be uh, split between um, a local cause, Phil Abundance here in Philadelphia, uh, World Central Kitchen, which is uh, Jose Andres's group, which you see, uh, on the news, feeding the world, no matter the most dangerous places they can find, it seems. So great work they do. And, and then also the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, that's an international organization that works towards uh, vaccination. So um, thank you with that. And I will, um, again, make the last pitch to join. Um, I think that the, what the membership is, is what the membership does. And I think that everybody's welcome to get involved. And so. Thank you, panelists. It's been a, a, a really interesting uh, conversation. I appreciate everybody who's logged in for this. This will be available uh, in a couple of days on the main CTBUH website. Um, so you'll be able to see a recording of this and me fumbling around for my words as I often do. 
but again, thank you to the panelists. Um, it, it was a great job, and, and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Scott. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Great job. Thank you, yeah, everybody. Everyone. All right, we'll see you guys.